drinks, I think. Thank God. A very warm welcome to Crawley. Thank you very much. Um, we'd like to talk about your, your career and your early life first of all, give people a background to you. Right. You were born in Basingstoke in Hampshire. Oh, nice. You're the daughter of an airline pilot. Goodness me. Um, you probably know more about me than I do. <laughs> very early age, you went to Elmhurst Ballet School. And I, I suppose do. every little girl goes through wanting to become a ballerina. Yes. Perhaps even your daughter does, I don't know. But, uh, mm, I don't know. I don't know what my daughter... My daughter at the moment wants to be um, a children's television presenter. Really? I think she'd be very she'd be very good. I can see her on Blue Peter. She's only eight, but I can see her now. <laughs> she likes making things out of, you know, cardboard boxes. and uh, She's very into that. But she'll change her mind. Sticky black plastic. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. That's a Blue Peter job, isn't it? Yeah, she wants to be a Blue Peter presenter. Well, there's a vacancy at the moment. She might be a little young. <laughs> and here's I one know. I made earlier. You acted in as Baby Ruth. Yes, my first professional job. You were nine years old. Yes. This is the Phoenix Theatre. Phoenix Theatre, Tottenham Court Road. You did three seasons of that. I did. And when um, the reason I, I got the audition for that was um, Elmhurst Bank School did um, a summer show at the end of the summer um, term. And I had been given quite a, a good part in it for, mm. for one of the youngest in the school. And the school had an agent, uh, Fraser Scamp, and she came along to see all the productions and if she thought someone stood out or whatever. And it so happened that they were auditioning for this um, musical, uh, Winnie the Pooh. Um, and she thought, oh, I think Sarah might be good for Baby Roo. So she rang the director and said, oh, I've got um, this little girl. I think she'd be very good. And he said, well, don't bother. Don't bother sending her because I don't want a girl. It's a boy. Baby Roo's got to be played by a boy. And my agent thought, I'm not having it. You've got, you just see her, just see her. And he said, okay, I've got 99 boys and I'll audition Sarah. So along I went and had this little song I had to sing. And uh, I arrived on this huge London stage. I was only nine. In fact, I wasn't quite nine then. I was eight and a half. In fact, my daughter's eight. And uh, I burst into tears. <laughs> so he said, oh, go off and get yourself and come back again later. He, he, he wasn't interested in me at all. And I came back and I, and I did my little piece and I got the job. Oh, is that great? 99 boys the audition. <laughs> <laughs> he ended up picking me after all. And I was, I was invited back three seasons, three Christmas seasons I did that, until I grew out of the costume. Frank Thornton was in that. Yes, Frank Thornton was in that. <coughs> um, oh gosh, who else did he have? Julian Slade. Julian Slade played Eeyore, and then Frank Thornton played Eeyore. Um, Christopher Biggins played Winnie the Pooh one year. Um, Jimmy Thompson played Pooh another year. We had um, Wayne Sleep played Tigger, and that was his first um, job outside the Royal Ballet. He'd only ever done stuff in the Royal Ballet, and this was his first job outside, and he was brilliant. That must be a great training Fantastic for you Tigger. as a nine-year-old child. I mean, you must learn so much. From oh that. yeah, I had. I just had the best time. I mean, everyone else was breaking up for Christmas holidays and going home, or sort of sitting at home, not wanting, annoying their parents for a few weeks before Christmas. I was going up to London every day, and I thought I had the best time. My mum and my dad always came with me, and um, going to the sandwich bar to get sandwiches for lunch and just being in London and it was I had a wonderful time there were only I think probably about four children in the production there was a boy who played Beetle and it was Christopher Robin and there was an understudy and myself um, and so we were surrounded by adults so I was brought up with a lot of adults from an early age you know, um, interacting with adults quite early on and we had a wonderful wonderful time it was great you trained, or well you did a diploma actually, which I think uh, the Guildhall School of Music and Drama. I didn't finish the diploma. Why? Why was that? Why did I finish it? What, why didn't you finish it? Why didn't I finish it? Because I'm a lazy old bossy and I hate studying. I don't, oh, just exams and things, I just hate it. I did, I did quite a lot of the grades and I got up to the diploma level, but I got Doctor Who. That's what happened, really. So before that then, you, you were doing, um, backtracking a little bit here. Your first TV job was mm. in something called Menace. I was 11. Yeah. Which was, I think, after the news on BBC One, it replaced Doomwatch, I think, on Monday night or something. It was a, was it a Monday night? There was a series called Menace, and they were... It was like an uh, umbrella title. Yes, wasn't that's it? right, and you had different different stories each week under the umbrella title of, of Menace. Yours was Boys and, and Girls, girls Come Out to Play with Peter Jeffrey, yes. who sadly died Christmas Day last year, didn't he? Yes, very um, sad. 
That actually, I don't know if you're aware of this, but that that doesn't exist anymore in the BBC archive. They destroyed that. That's a real shame. Were you aware of that? No. It doesn't it. surprise me, but I think it's a real it's shame. It's colour. It's the seventies, mm -hmm. and they've still destroyed it. I think it's. Uh, and at the time, um, there were a lot of letters about that production to the Radio Times. You know how they have a page of letters to the Radio Times? Well, they've had that for years. And every single letter the, w the week after was about that production. It was very it thought provoking. Was, it wasn't was. It? For its time, it was really quite the idea of children, drugs, murder. Um, bullying. I mean, it had it had everything in it, really. It's very relevant for the yeah, for the, the days. Yes, it is, and it's a shame. It's they've um, they've deleted it, whatever it is they do to it. It is a real shame. Now that was written by James McTaggart. Yes. And he directed yes, a play for today, didn't he? You did as well. Yes. That's also been destroyed now. I'd ever say. Um, Baby, Baby Blues. Blues. Has that been deleted yeah. as well? Yeah. It's sad, isn't it? Very sad. People think of TV junking as like fifties and sixties black and white material, but it's not the case, really. They must. They must have some sort of selective process what what categorizes something that they delete and they keep because they can't have deleted everything from the center they, 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 they have like a 10 point plan they have like uh, I suppose 10 that the most important the historical significance like the Apollo moon landing or something right, like that yes. or an important interview with somebody or whatever mm. David Frost interviews while and wick or whatever but they have like I suppose they, they keep various episodes so your particular episode has been destroyed unfortunately mm. thanks a bunch <laughs> 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 Because James McTaggart um, directed me in my next, the next thing I did when I was 12 was Alice. Through the Looking Glass. He directed that. Jeffrey Belbaden, wasn't it, as well? Yes, Jeffrey Belbaden, yes, played yes. The White Knight. Yes, we had a fantastic cast. Um, Brenda Bruce, Judy Parfit played the Red Queen, Brenda Bruce played the White Queen. In fact, after lunch, I bought um, my photo albums that my mum and dad put together and that I've done over the years, and, and there's all these pictures in there, and the clips in the Radio Times at the time and everything, they're quite interesting, so you're welcome to, I'll bring them down, you can all have a little look, they're quite good fun to look at. They, this this is something about. that the BBC, and not just BBC, but it's revived quite quite often, Alice Through the Looking Glass, or Alice in Wonderland, oh, various productions and there was one a couple of years ago, I think, on, on Boxing Day, yes, it was, was. was very good, and it's something that they seem... it's a timeless they subject. Seem to, they seem to want to redo all the time, don't they? They're sort of whether they think they can improve it. Or the production I did was quite um, something in its day. Oh my God, it just sounds so dated now. But it was the first production that was nearly all colour separation overlay. Well, of course, they don't use that technique anymore. I mean, it's just so dated. I mean, it's all done on computer nowadays. But then it was really, whoa, this is a fantastic production. It's a, you know, the cutting edge of technology. <coughs> and now it's obsolete as a technique. It, that's scary. Well, if you old. <laughs> You also, you, you appeared in a, a soap opera called Westway, I think, didn't you? Oh, yeah, Great oh HTV God, yes, Sylvester yeah. Latouza was in that. Which ran for, for a few few seasons, all episodes. That was really, that was good fun. We filmed down the Bristol area for that, and um, it was, uh, some of it was done during term time. A lot of the productions I did, I was very fortunate, they happened to fall in school holidays, which worked really well. But this one, actually, I missed some school, so we had to have a tutor, and we had to have a certain amount of hours a day where we did lessons and things. I mean, they would dawdle compared to what I'd had to How did the school, school react to you missing lessons? Then? They? Um, they were quite, I think they were okay about it, because it was a ballet school, theatrically type school. I, mean, I think if it happened to my, my daughter's at an ordinary, um, she's at private school, but it's an ordinary school. Um, and I think they would, have a, they would have a big problem with it, I have to say. But I was at a school that... Ultimately, people were hoping to end up doing that as their own profession, so I suppose they were quite lenient about it. But there, were, there, were, there are rules that you have to do so many hours a day, tuition, and um, we did that. But that was that was really good fun to do. And I remember, I, th I got, I can't have been very old, but I had far too much, got hold of some wine. It was all coming out now. I, I won, when Rag Trade won the Grand National, <laughs> I had, was it 12 to 1 or 6 to 1? I can't remember what and it was. Won. And I won. And I spent all my own. I spent all my winnings that night. We all went out for a meal, and uh, seemed to have lots of Matthias Rosé. I seem to remember as, as was the thing then. <laughs> but no, it was, they, that was that was good fun. I enjoyed that. One of the things that I I look back on in your career, and I, I know that Craig is a big fan of it as well, is is the Moon Stallion. <laughs> yeah. I was trying to think the other day what makes that series special. I think. It's the kind of thing that appeared a lot in the 60s and 70s. It, it's family entertainment as opposed to children's entertainment. Yeah. It's the 9 or 90. 
apart from perhaps the Magician's House and one or two other things in recent years, very, very few, few productions are made for the family, as opposed to you know adults, teenagers, It's a very children. special quality as well, isn't it, to be able to produce something that covers that, that generation. Indeed. And I think it's very hard to do, and I think that's why there are so few. But The Moon Stallion is, I wish they'd repeat it more often really, but it's a lovely uh, It is lovely, story. and a fantastic cast. And David Haig, well, it was her, his first television. <coughs> Um, Caroline Goodall. Um, it was it was a lovely it was a lovely production to do. And for me, I felt like I was really uh, sad now. But I thought I was really grown up then, because it was the first production I'd ever done where I was old enough not to have a chaperone. I didn't have to have my mum or my dad or anywhere else, anyone else. I just felt so grown up. I thought I was a bee's knees, and uh, and I have such fond memories of it for that. It was. It was lovely. And 11 weeks filming down in Wiltshire in the summer, you know, weather like this. It was a real joy to do. Has your daughter seen this? this uh, she has watched the Moon Stallion. What does she think of it? She really enjoyed it, but she's not... She's only just now started to get interested in the Doctor Who thing. She's watched... A, she started to watch a couple, but she's not really got into it. I don't... Um, I haven't pushed it on her. She saw Dimensions in Time when she was very little. She must have been, because that's how many years old, Dimensions in Time? 93. 93. Yeah. Um, and she's, she recognised me, and she said, Mummy running, monster chasing Mummy. And that's all she says about it. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, well, she summed it up, really. There's really not a lot else you can say about that. That's quite a, yes. a good description, really. Monster chasing Mummy, yeah. Mummy running. Mm. Yes, that's, that's fine. You've, you've got it there in a nutshell. You don't need to worry about it anymore. I seem to remember you, uh, watching you something on BBC One about uh, Byron, the, the poet. And I think God, it was yes. Frederick Raphael had done something. Yes. And it was like one of those weird things that they did in those days. I think they do it a lot now. Semi-documentary. So yes. you've got like a documentary, but it's like done in, in with people acting yeah. the parts. And you were hearing that. that as well. Yes. But it wasn't, I didn't have a huge... Part in it. it was, I think it took a long time to do that series and people just sort of slotted in on the odd day. Um, and I can't remember where we filmed that. It was a beautiful house. I think it was sort of Tunbridge Wells Way somewhere. Some, some... Um, oh, I might have been further into Kent. Stately actually, Home yeah. or something. It was lovely. And also you were in Arthur Miller's Crucible, weren't you? Yes. BBC. Yes. This is something that film plays used to happen a lot of years ago. You'd have, you'd have the Wednesday play and Armchair Theatre yeah. and yeah, Play Today Play gone. of the Month. Where now you have like mini feature films, don't mm -hmm. you? It, it's not the same, is it? No, the television has changed dramatically, hasn't it? I mean, it's there isn't. I mean, of an evening, what is there that's for actors, British actors? By it's the time you've got American rid of product there as well, yeah, isn't there? Yeah, by the time you've got rid of you know ground force, changing rooms, what changing rooms times two, home front. What is worth watching? There isn't Nothing. much, is there really? I mean, I love documentaries, so I'm quite. I mean, I'm you know, I love time watch and I, you know, I'm, I'm yes, I do. They're very good. They're very it's good. It's all the same, isn't it? Every night you think, well, what can I watch? And there isn't and there's nothing. You get the odd new thing, but I mean, it's really. I mean, if you talk about the population of actors, there's never got a hope of ever Bring employing back everybody. Doctor Who. <laughs> <laughs> we we come now to Doctor Who, which is probably why we invited you here for the next about it. Quite a <laughs> originally, your, your character of Nyssa was only going to be a one story, mm -hmm. is, is the keeper of tracking. How did you come to, to be auditioned for that particular role? Um, my agent literally rang me up and said they're auditioning for this story of Doctor Who. Go along to Threshold House, room so and so, you're seeing John Black, the director. Um, producer's Jonathan Turner, but you might not get to see him. Um, get yourself along there. So, on I went, really, and read um, a couple of scenes for John. Uh, John Black, and he said, oh, fine, can you just wait a moment? And he obviously went zipping upstairs to John Nathan Turner's office, and he said, well, you know, could you come and listen? So John Nathan Turner came down, and I had to do it again. He said, well, thank you very much, we'll let you know. And a few days later, they rang and said, yes, we'd like Sarah to do it. But also John Nathan Turner liked your character, because he had an option then to use it in The Gopolis, mm. the next story. If that worked, then to have you for Peter yes. Jason's first season. So he must have thought your performance was good enough. And the character well, that's right. I mean, I don't know at what point he knew. I mean, I don't know how flexible they are that far in advance, if you know what I mean. Whether he he could he, he could move a lot to fit me, in or whether it was planned from the very beginning that this might be a character that would continue through. I don't know. Actually, I read somewhere that Johnny Byrne, who who, who developed the character, who created it, 
he got a small commission for every story you that character oh, really? appeared in. So oh. little little check appeared every time yes, you, you appeared yes, in. Yeah, good for him. <laughs> I'm pleased for him. <laughs> um, obviously, people are going to ask some questions about Doctor Who later. I, I, I imagine, but uh, you appeared in thirteen Doctor Who stories in total. Uh, although perhaps kinder, you weren't in that very much. No. Really, really. You, you I, had a, I had a headache or a stomachache. Had to lay down in the darkness. <laughs> lay down in the dark. Um, then you left the series in '83. How was that? Because you, you, you've been almost with a family, I suppose, yes. for, for those two years. Was it strange not being in that series anymore? anymore? It was. It was very strange, and um, hadn't really been my in, my intention to go. Um, I don't think. Sometimes it's difficult to remember what goes through your head, but um, it was a production decision for Nissa to go, really. I think I probably would have carried on because as I'm basically a very lazy person. And it was, it was once you get into something like that, I'm always amazed and, and, and in awe of a lot of these actors who are in things like EastEnders, Coronation Street or whatever, doing really well, and they decide to go. And it's a very brave decision because if you think about it, it's a very precarious profession, even more so now than ever, ever, ever. And to actually make that decision to say, well, okay, you know, maybe they've got things lined up, but even so, they don't last forever. So it's quite a brave decision, and I think I would have been a real coward, I think. And if I'd been given the choice, I probably would have hung on a bit longer. Um, I enjoyed working with Peter and Janet and Mark a lot, and, that, and I was very sad to go. Um, you After you left Doctor Who, you, you appeared in... I didn't a, do a lot, really. No, but you appeared in a, a, a play, a, is it Policy for Murder? Yes. Oh, with uh, George Seal and Nat Andrea, which went yes. on to about 18 weeks. Yes, it did. Oh, God. You obviously don't have fond memories of that, do you? Well, I do and I don't. I mean, it was... I don't know what I feel about it, really. It just it did seem to go on forever. I just... That's not really me. Um, I'd done so much telly in my, in my career that... I think I've become a very telly person, a very telly actress, which is not, not a good thing. Um, and I don't think I suit theatre so well, certainly not long runs like that. I Even like though you started off? I know, theater. yeah. But that was only for sort of, it was a shortish run, and it was very different. And I just found that I didn't, I found it very hard having left Doctor Who, where everything was changing the whole time. A new script every month, new people. You know, you did something, you finished it, you moved on. I found actually the repetition of doing the same thing. And also being away from home, I'm quite living a home around. Yeah, yes. I, I didn't really like living out of a suitcase and changing digs every week. And um, sometimes it was good fun if it was a nice place. We managed to get someone nice to say, but sometimes it could be really dreary, quite honestly. And I thought, what am I doing this for? Um, I did panto after that, which was a bit of a disaster again as well. But um, no, I, I think I lost my way a bit after I left Doctor Who. Mm. Um, I lost direction quite quite quickly and my agents sort of got a bit iffy with me because I'd moved agents by then um, and basically told me to pull my finger out and I didn't like being told that either. So. It's very difficult though because after you've appeared on television in such a, a TV series that's so well known, typecasting is always a problem for, mm, for an actor yes. and actress and you were, your face was known then wasn't it? Yes. And uh, a casting director would think, oh Sarah Sutton, Doctor Who, right, next yeah. kind of thing, without being rude, they yeah. must think that. They I must mean, think that. And you've got to be a very strong type of person to be able to fight through all that and make yourself be seen as something else. And the time that I left Doctor Who was a time I was, how well, old I, 21 or something. Um, and I'd been working for a long time, all my childhood, and I hadn't really had a teenage, teenage years that most people have. And I had that came all late for me. And I'd also met the man that turned out to be my husband. You missed him at the 21st yeah. birthday party, didn't and you? And I thought, well, I'm enjoying actually being doing normal things, like going to the pub and going out with his friends and seeing what he does, And because I'd never had all that. And leaving Doctor Who coincided with that, so I lost a lot of ambition and a lot of drive, and it was at a very dangerous time, because that was the time I needed most drive. And I think that's really what happened. You mentioned your husband, Michael, there. Is it true you had your honeymoon? Was it a... Doctor Who mentioned, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that is really sad, isn't it? <laughs> well, it happened that we decided to... I'd already arranged to do this convention. And we were engaged. We got married quite quickly. We were engaged in March. We were married in the July. Was it March or April? Or May even. We were married in July. And I'd already, the year before, agreed to do this. So you knew you had this in your schedule? 
and the wedding just happened to be that was the best weekend and we thought well okay we'll go but we'll go early and stay in San Francisco which we did we had about six days in San Francisco beforehand and then did the convention so, or five days five or six days so. the convention was in San Jose just south of San Francisco so I suppose also that there's you know having had decided to start a family there must be a conscious decision to put your career on the back burner to do that because it's, it, an actor doesn't have this problem an actress does are you going to have children? You know, do, yes, does my no family come yes, first? No that must be problem. very, very difficult. It is, and by actually, by the time I'd had Hannah, my career had gone past, really. Um, I mean, I'd already spent years not working before Hannah came along, so, um, you know, that, that, that window of opportunity had gone, really. I mean, nowadays, with the business as it is, mm -hmm. you don't work for a while, you, you know, you're really going to struggle. I've got a big problem at the moment because my agent's retiring. I've gone back to my original agent I had when I was seven and a half. Um, I went back to her years ago. And she's now very elderly and she's not been very well and she's retiring. So she's not going to have an agency anymore. And um, I'm going to be agentless in a few weeks' time. And that's pretty much, if you don't have an agent, we're really stuck. I've seen you. You were in uh, Casualty, I think, a few yes, years back. Yeah. And I've seen you in 999. Um, <laughs> And you, you've done this this uh, CD with Peter Davidson. Yes, uh, I'm in the middle of doing another one, actually. I did. I was in London yesterday. I've got to go back to London tomorrow to finish it. What's that like? Because they're almost really like, the, like uh, episodes, aren't I they? Know, this is the closest really you're ever going to get to, to yeah. doing Doctor Who, really. It's really weird. And in fact, with the, when I did the first one, Land of the Dead, which was mm -hmm. recorded last August, walked into this little studio and uh, Gary Russell was sitting on the floor and um, I, I was completely unaware, but apparently... Peter and I started reading the first scene, and apparently he just looked up. He said, "This is really weird. It's they, the two of them sound like twenty years ago. It's new, because it is new twenty years." I was going to ask you: Is it difficult resurrecting a character you hadn't actually played properly since it's nineteen eighty three? No, I found it really easy. And do you? I mean, like, just really pitching your voice. It. Were you conscious of well, that? Well, yes. I mean, Peter's voice has changed quite a lot. Yes, it He's has. dropped. Yeah. Yeah. And I think my voice probably has dropped as you get older. Your voice does sort of mellow and, and deepen, and it has. But um, I think that matters so much. I just think if the spirit is still there and, and the right relationship. I have a slight problem actually with the one we're doing at the moment. I shouldn't we really tell you too much about it because it was still in the doing it. But the chap who's written, he was a script editor. What was his name? Andrew Connell? Yes. After I'd left. Yeah. So he doesn't really have much of a knowledge of Nissan. Mm. And it really should. I read it and I thought. Mm got all this wrong. <laughs> <laughs> this is Tegan. I should no. this is Te this is Tegan. I mean I say things which are really smart allocation. I'm quite mm. familiar with the doctor and mm. I'm telling him off and bossing around people. <laughs> this isn't Nissa. And I said, Well are you ha they're quite happy with that. Fine, but you know I'm just telling you now this is not Nissa. And I have found that quite hard. I've enjoyed doing it because it's quite nice to play yeah. something a bit different and not the same old Nissa sort of a, being a bit meek and mild. But if they really wanted to keep to authentic Doctor Nissa relationship, it's going to be very different. This one, it's going to be quite interesting. These, these episodes are obviously or stories, I should say, are obviously set before Nissa le left the Doctor. Right? Yes, they're, it's they're a very strange setup, really. Um, I'd like one to be written as if he's met her again after Terminus. It'd be nice to know what's happened to Nissa, wouldn't mm. she? She's, she's with all these men on this on this. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think she, I don't know whether she should have stayed there that long. I think she was bored. What, what happened in that last episode when you well, Don't uh, ask me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't going, know. What was going on there where you're losing your, your half, half of your, what Close. you're wearing? I, don't, I have no idea. That was Blame John Nathan Turner for that. It's all his fault. I had all this pretty underwear and I think John decided that as it was my last episode people should see it before it was their last chance. <laughs> So I mean, you should make it this thing, you've got a stomachache or something, yeah. and it's quite hot or whatever, and it seems a bit bizarre. It is very bizarre. Very odd. Glad we don't all go around doing that, and we've got tummy aches and things. <laughs> 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 it would be a bit odd, wouldn't it? Just to open this up a bit now, does anybody want to ask Sarah Sutton a question? <coughs> about, not just about Doctor Who, maybe, anything. but about her career, anything? Anything? Do we yeah. have any questions? I'll go first then. Yes, you Were you interviewed for the recent Doctor Who night? Did you have your oh. own interview? No. You won't. Right. <laughs> we were told we were told that all the all the companions were interviewed. Almost everybody was interviewed. They did this theme night on, on BBC two with Tom Baker acting I as was. Uh, an anchor. I have to forgive you my <coughs> recalling memory. I think I probably was. So you ended up on the cutting room floor, yeah. probably. Yeah. 
Yeah. Just wondering how you felt about that. Mm. I think we I feel did. As if we've been cheated by it. Really. Yeah. Mm. I think it wasn't enough, innit? I think they're going to they're going to produce the the drafts in Doctor Who magazine. So as, as a I think I'm sure I was, but it was at a convention, and a lot of it, as you know, have all been at big conventions. To be honest, I, I get totally befuddled because you have people come up to you all the time. Can you do an interview for this magazine? Can we record? And at the end of the day, I don't know who's asking me about what for what what it's for. But uh, now it's all coming back to me. I seem to remember now, but it was a while ago. I mean, it was a long time ago before, because that wasn't long ago on the telly, was it? That's November. That's right. And it was ages, but it must have been at least a year before that I was interviewed. But as you say, I must have ended up. Yeah, you did. A lot of other people did as well. I probably didn't have anything yeah. interesting to say. That's why. Very few people actually ended up at, you know, oh, don't, don't worry about it. <laughs> um, I promised with this yesterday when you were doing a, an audio recording just before lunch everybody's stomach starts going <laughs> sorry sorry about my tummy <laughs> you must finally want to clear your throat all the time you're doing uh, audio thing as well no I just not know I, I, I really enjoy audio actually I've done five radio plays at the BBC when I was younger um, some down at BBC Bristol and a couple in London and really enjoy them. I love audio, and I'd love to do more. I'd love to do more voiceovers. Is it a different plays. technique? Or, uh, it's just so... I, I just find the freedom of not having to worry about what you're doing with your face and your body, that you just really concentrate on what your voice is doing, and you can... The little tiny intonations, you can really play with that, and I, I find that really liberating. I, I, I love it. I love not having to worry about... the you know, the persona and what, what, what you're looking like and what you're doing. But just concentrating on the sounds and, and, and the intonations of what you're saying is really I suppose, interesting. you should say that, I suppose radio is one of the last places where plays now can, yeah, be, can yeah. be done properly. But even there, it's Because sort of TV now has just, just wiped it yeah. out. So, I mean, the case, as you say, there are very, very few plays on the radio, but there, are, there is the, the Radio 4 play, yeah. they have played before bedtime, things like that. So they, they still do it occasionally. And I do love listening to people who've got lovely voices. There's still nothing like it. If you couldn't watch them when you're watching the television, close your eyes and just deprive yourself of the visual. It's, you get you can actually get an awful lot. I, I just love I love radio and I, and I love do I really enjoy doing these CDs. I'm doing another one. Oh, shut up. Yeah. Um, with Peter later on in the year, a Dalek story. I think they're doing a Dalek story for all the doctors that they've used. Really, oh, interesting. So there'd be a third CD after one you're doing at the moment then? Yeah, I did one last year, I'm doing one at the moment, and they, they're hoping that I'll be able to do another one with Peter. So this is turning out to be a little series then, isn't mm -hmm. it? I don't know how many they've produced so far. Quite a few, I think Steve's got more up there somewhere. Six, 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 six so far, yeah. I think there's going to be quite a few more. So they've done quite really quick. well, they're, they're really pleased with them. And everyone seems mm. to really enjoy doing them, they're a really, real laugh. Any other questions for Sarah? What was your relationship with um, your companions and the Doctor? And were there any practical jokes? <laughs> um, God, I just don't remember any specific practical jokes, but there was always um, there was always something. We're always pulling each other's legs. I mean, Peter yesterday, we run through a scene. Gary said, like, "Read it through," and Peter said to me, "I don't think I've read this before," so we didn't know what we were saying. And I said, "I'm totally confused. Can you?" Just before we record this, can you just just give me five minutes? See, and I was I was reading it through to make sure I understood what I was saying. It was all very quiet, and Peter just said, "It was always like this." Pucker <laughs> 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 was always like he was always pulling he's pulling our legs all the time. But um, uh, no, it's um we had a good relationship, and I, I really miss really did miss that when I left. Yeah. It's like a family, I suppose, to some extent, isn't it? Extended yeah. family, maybe. I got on well with with Mark, and I got on very well with, with Janet. Um, I don't see anything of Janet anymore. I just speak to her on the phone the other day because I rang her to ask about agents. <laughs> she wasn't very helpful, really. She's really, <laughs> she's really pushed up to who? To yeah. the back of her mind? <coughs> well, she used to be an agent, which is why I phoned her, and I knew she'd left the agency, and she's now writing. But I thought she might know of somebody, some chum somewhere <laughs> that would take me on, but I think she basically told me that um, I got a snowball's Chance in hell or something like that. Very blunt. Yeah, she can be very blunt. She said, I'm sorry, she said, it's just the truth. And I said, well, I know, yeah, I know, I know that. I know, I know you're just being honest and <laughs> no point giving me any waffle. She's quite right, really. But there we are. Have you, uh, have you tried Wendy Pebbery? I have. Uh, She's not taking on anyone either. She works for um, an agency called Evans and Rice. 
And in fact, Jan Evans used to be an assistant at my agent, so I've known Jan, or Jan's known me since I was quite small. But they're just not taking on anybody else. Talk about an overcrowded profession. You, know, you hear of agents just getting rid of people. <coughs> just phone giving them a ring and saying, I'm sorry, you're not on the books anymore. Very hard now. It's very it's changed a lot. People have become, and I think that's not really true, but a lot of things actually people have become very hard, I think. Very cutthroat. People will tread on anybody to get anywhere, I think, nowadays. I think it's really sad. So what will we do if we can't find another agent? <laughs> no idea. There isn't rep now, is there? Actors years ago used to go into rep. That, that doesn't seem to exist anymore, does it? No. no I mean, it's, There's it's no way to learn your trade anymore. No, I mean, I should have done that. I should have gone to drama school, I think. Um, there's lots of things I should have done. But, you know, you make decisions at the time, don't you? It's easy in retrospect. It's, it's very easy to look back on your life and say, I should have done that. I should have done, done that, that. but you, yes, know yeah. what you know now, don't you? I mean, it's life. You live your like life, that. you can't. Yeah, exactly. It's not a second no. uh, stability. We all had crystal ball, wouldn't we? we no, yeah. Very true. <laughs> Any other questions for Sarah? Talk. What memories do you have of working with Tom for the two stories? With Tom, um, <laughs> I, was very ner I was very nervous. Um, considering, you imagine, I've just joined Doctor Who, which was pretty awe-inspiring to start with, and then you've got this character, Tom, and uh, I was absolutely terrified of him, absolutely terrified. I can understand that. We had Tom here yeah, in November, and I was no, quite terrified. <laughs> 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 he quite, he kind of dominates. He does. He? Um, and he's an amazing person. And, um, I wouldn't I say no to him, really? No. He used to call me Miss Basingstoke, which used to really irritate me. Yes, he told us that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it's That's really it, rude, isn't it? I he mean, said, what? I don't know. I kind of, I don't know why, what he was trying to say by it, really. I mean, well, you're an actress. So. You don't want to be intimidated by someone mm. like that, do you? No. I don't think he did it intentionally. I just think it's just his manner, and um, I was just very. I was 19 years old and very innocent, and sort of just in awe of him, really. He was probably very, very born with the role in as well, because he's coming towards the end. Yeah, of his and it was all, I mean, it was a very emotional time, and he was leaving and Peter joining, and it was, the whole thing was in turmoil a bit. Um, so it, it was a very strange time, but um, but I still have fond memories of it. I mean, I, it's, it was exciting. Um, and I was really excited when I knew Peter was gone, because I, I, I loved him in All Creatures, and I thought, oh, this is going to be really good fun, and he was. He was very much more approachable than Tom. It must have been easier also because he was starting and you were like, you, you'd been Yes, I was slightly ahead of him, yeah. So it gave yeah. you equal footing in some yes, respects. I've been there, done that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He was yeah. obviously learning his, his yeah. character as well, which you yeah. had to do when he first. Um, it was a big turnover because Janet joined, Pete joined. I mean, Matthew had been there longer than, than any of us. Um, what was Matthew you like <laughs> to work with? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to reward this and she was quite rude about it, so obviously... Oh, don't ask Lana about him, oh God, no, don't ask Lana about Wasn't there a time when he was ill? He right. was, he was, because he drank too much. On location, um, doing Castro Valva, which we filmed out of sequence, didn't we? Mm. Yes. That's right, I think it was... Uh, four, that fourth one. Yeah, 42 yeah. mistakes. It's a bit first weird that I don't find out why. Yes, he drank too much. We had we were staying in a hotel on location. It's always bad. It's always bad news saying that because you give actors a stick them in a hotel and they'll they'll drink. Um, so he'd had too much, far too much to drink, and he was he was green. I mean, there is that picture of there's Peter sitting on a bridge, and I'm sitting to the side, and there's mm -hmm. Janet and, and Matthew standing behind, and he does. He looks he looks green, doesn't he? He does look definitely <laughs> green around the gills. It's just so funny. No, he did. He threw up rather than what poor chap. We could never find him during the day, and he was just lying in the long grass, just <laughs> 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 gazing up. I'd find him in the grass. Where's Matthew? <laughs> <laughs> Poor boy. <laughs> Any other questions? Anybody? Dried up? Mm. What was the reason for your thinking, Kinder, you weren't in it at all? I don't know. When I signed the contract for that beginning of that season, the 24 episodes or whatever it was, I was down for 22 or 24 episodes and being a complete idiot. I mean, I just signed it without questioning. Um, that may have been written before you'd, you know, that your been, character yes. had been, and they would could have, have to write. And also, I mean, I think, I think it was a very overcrowded TARDIS, really. It was too many, yeah. wasn't it? And, you know, I don't know if anyone's tried to write 
tried to write a Doctor Who story, it's actually quite complicated. You've got to have these three climaxes, you know, something exciting happening at the end of each. And you've got to split everybody up. You can't have a Doctor and three assistants all together. Yeah, they all have to go in different together. directions yeah. to do their own it, things. Yes. And, and so it dilutes the story. So it, it is easier to give. I mean, Janet had a good, very good, strong story with, with Kinder. And, Mainly because Nissa was out of the way, and it was just one less person to think about, really. One less person to write things for. Um, that worked quite well in, in your last story, Terminus, because you were split up, mm, weren't you? Yes. And that's that quite a strong story, maybe, because it's, of that. Mark spent four, he spent four episodes on his hands and knees <laughs> behind the scaffolding. It's like a scaffolding, it's very basic. <laughs> yeah, no, I, had, it was a good, I, was good, I was pleased with my last story, actually. Yeah, it's good. I was glad she didn't sort of get sent off to marry someone or something. Chapped the lot, didn't it? Was that your favourite story? Terminus, mm, no, I liked Earthshock and um, Black Orchid, my two favourites. And um, Black Orchid is a very unusual Doctor Who story because it, it's almost a non-Doctor Who I story. Know. Maybe that's why I liked it. It, it could actually. have been something like Agatha Christie yeah. or, or... I uh, loved it. Somebody, n nothing to do with Doctor Who or, or, or special effects or anything. It was a nice story, mm. wasn't it? It was lovely, and I think it, it just really broke the season up. I was thinking it was a really good idea. It was more in the vein of the old historical story. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I think Doctor Who fans watching probably thought, oh, oh, well, that's a bit different. Oh, well, then next week we're back to normal. But I think I think it worked really well. It did. Yeah. Yeah. The old historical stories used to break it up a bit better. Yes. I once it became so science fiction driven. Yeah. It doesn't as much. Yes, that's I think you, you need it just yeah. to because if you talk to some of the earlier actresses and actors of it, they all all say they all enjoyed the historical stories because it gave them a chance. Well, for an actor, that's something yes. to yes. really get, to get well, their teeth. And it also ang it anchors the story somewhere. You've got some point of reference, whereas the ones that are totally science fiction, it does. You tend to sort of lose it a bit. I mean, well, I do because I don't have that sort of brain. But you do. What was the one? Oh, Visitation. That was the other mm. one that I really liked. The, the fire and pudding main. That was a good one to do. Mm. Yeah, I enjoyed those. It's, I think it's probably a common theme, actually, with, as you say, with the actors that yeah. the historical ones yeah. seem to stick in your head more. Yeah. Did you have much choice in your costumes? No. <laughs> 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 no, and that's the other thing about Black Order, of course, we've got to be able to change into something, to wear something else, oh, joy. <laughs> um, yeah, it was, uh, no, we didn't really. I, I must say I liked all my costumes. I, the first one, I think, was lovely, and, and I know when we... John Edmund Turner put me into trousers. He got quite a little letter saying, where have Sarah's legs gone? And see her legs, which is why I went back into the, the, the stripy thing. That wasn't quite so popular. Peter didn't like that one. Is it true that uh, Sandra Dickinson actually told me to say that you look like a deck chair? Well, I don't remember her saying that to me, but she might have said to someone else. I don't yeah. know. A bit rude, but, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, it was a bit... Um, it was a strange outfit, though. I, mean, I, mean, I, I quite liked it because it was colourful. I always thought this well, would be something... Yeah. It changes, it's changes as good as the rest, mm -hmm. isn't it? When you're in the same costume week after week, anything is, you, you look forward to wearing anything different. But the last costume was lovely. And it's a shame, actually, on the telly, you don't actually see a lot of the details of these lovely costumes. Our first one, which was velvet, there was beautiful paintwork on sleeves. it. Yes. yes. But it, in, in the velvet, they'd sort of painted like spray painted. Mm -hmm. um, and it was lovely, you never saw any of that on the telly. Actually, you've got you really get close to the costume and the work that, the, that goes into them that no one really appreciates. It's, I think that's really sad. I suppose you've only got so much time to, to put a story across, and yeah. those details that do get lost, yeah. don't they? But some of the, the people at BBC are very talented the costume people, and uh, it was a shame that some of their work doesn't really get its full reward, really. Did you ever keep anything from the time of Doctor Who costume or prop I did, actually. And you're not supposed to. I just completely, genuinely, I forgot <laughs> to take the thing off. Well, you took it home. Yeah, I forgot to take it home. It's the thing I wore around my neck. And again, someone probably wouldn't was it choking, notice though, it. No, it was a gold chain. And when I came to my last, when I they did my last costume, they said, well, you need something around your neck. What can we get? And they, they gave me, I think, 50 quid to go and buy something. And 82, whatever it was, quite a lot of money. And I went um, to Covent Garden. Oh, the market there? Yeah. I know. And I bought this gold pendant, and it's full of, it's made up of lots of blobs of gold, little rounds, and there's a little red stone, I think it's like a garnet or something. And um, it's quite sort of surreal looking, it doesn't have any particular shape. Um, and so I put that on a gold chain, and I still have that. 
and I should have given it back. Mm. <laughs> I get into trouble now. Um, but I just completely did forget to take it off. But things like that are a nightmare when you're recording because if you do wear it and you take it home and you take it off at home and you don't remember to bring it back the next day, continuity are going up the wall. I just went, <laughs> oh my God, the last scene, last scene, you left that room and you're wearing it and we're doing the scene where you're walking through the next door and you haven't got the thing on. And yeah, It can be, but in fact there was, when I had the velvet outfit, I had a little brooch in the neck and there is one shop where it, it it disappears and jumps back in again because we forgot to put it on. <laughs> Continuity person got a little while looking for that. We'll have to look for that sometime. Right? Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure it's there. <laughs> if you mentioned your your daughter has aspirations to become a, a children's presenter, if she wanted to become an actress, would you dissuade her or try and dissuade yeah, her? Yeah, dissuade her. No, because I think if, if she what, what she wants to do, you've got to really want to do something. There's absolutely no point in me telling her she's got to be a biochemist if she doesn't want to be a bio. I mean, it's just ridiculous. She doesn't. She's very different to me. She's um, she's a lot brighter than I. I have to say, I hope this at maths, and she's actually very good at maths. Takes after her daddy like that. Um, and she's also very good at sport, and I never played any sport. She likes hockey. She likes watching. She, I left her this morning lying in bed watching match of the day. She's watching. <laughs> she likes Manchester United. She wanted to see the goals, and I mean, she's she's very sporty and um, and great. We don't have a lot of dolls in the house. I mean, she's just not a dolly sort of little girl. And it's it's really nice actually having a daughter that's quite quite keen to sort of have a go at things. She's quite a tomboy. It's, it's quite good fun. So um, she's very different to me. But I don't think I can't see her wanting to be an actress. I'm sure that she'll change her mind about being a presenter. Um, I thought she might not want to be a vet because her daddy yeah, being a doctor. Oh, vet, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought she might want to be a vet, but she said she she just shakes her head. She's no, I I get too upset. She gets very upset about. It. She can't watch anything on the television about animals being her. She gets very distressed about that. But we nearly lost our dog last year. He ran out on the road, and he got one car glanced his bottom and spun him round, which was fortunate because the other car going the other way went straight over his hips. And she saw that, and I was screaming, I was screaming, and I ran out. She ran down the garden, she hid down the bottom of the garden, and it really upset her. And even now, she gets, if we let the dog out in the driveway, she goes and, you know, no, no, don't let him go near the road, don't let him, and this was it's nearly a year mm -hmm. ago, and she, she's never, she won't forget that he was off the lead in the driveway. If he's off the lead in the driveway, he might, you know, go across the road. Um, so I, um, she, at the moment, I can't. She won't even come with me to have the dog to have his injections or the cat. She, I can't look. I can't look. I can't look at the needle. Oh, God. So I don't think. I don't think she'll be a vet. But I said, you know, you're a bit young. Yeah, it's probably still a bit scary to go to the vets. But um, I would like her to be a vet because I just think that's what I would like to have been if I'd been clever enough. Really? Is that something you wanted to do? Then? I love animals, and the idea of, you know, actually. Helping, I just think would be would have been lovely. In fact, my husband, funnily enough, he said if he got his time again, he'd have, he'd want to be a vet. Interesting. He came from a family where they never had any animals in the house. He had a he had a tortoise, but he said it ran away. <laughs> so, <laughs> it was sad. It's worth a lot of money now, tortoise. Yeah, I know. Very I said you could go and find that from a tortoise and <laughs> sell it. Um, and he, but since he met me, and I'm a real animal person. He's become as obsessed about them as I am. You know, we want to get more cats, and we'd like to probably have another dog. And, and he says, now, if he could have his life again, wouldn't be a doctor, be a vet. So it's, it's interesting how life changes, how you, you meet certain people in your life, and you can... More just, difficult, because animal can't tell you if, what's wrong I know, with it. Well, the training's longer, isn't it? Because they can't... It is a bit, yeah. yeah, seven years or something against five years. But, um, it's funny, my wife's a doctor, too. She's serious about it. Isn't that funny? Yeah. <laughs> I've got no desire to be a doctor. <laughs> 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 very wise, it's very wise. It's really lousy, especially if you're GP now. God. People making wise cracks. You're like, oh, your patient's died recently. Yeah, it must Someone be awful. else it must says be that. Yes, yeah, so it can't be much fun. One of my wife's partners says, God, shit. Oh, so poor fit. Oh, 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 that's miserable. Yeah, she thinks, oh, someone else comes up to me and makes, hey, you carry more feeling in your bag. Oh, no way. <laughs> we live in an age where the media oh, is, is scary, merciless. It? They, yeah. they pick it's something, really and it could be the Rover car plant, or it could yeah. be the health service, and they it's just mercilessly, mercilessly 
attack yeah. it and you really no one's got a hope with that sort of a machine against them it's wrong really I think a free press is the most important thing in the world but I think it needs to at least be accurate yes it's, yeah. it's, there's a very fine line between having a free press and being responsible I think as mm. well with it. a very difficult line to tread though it's very easy to tip one way or the other isn't it but it's um, yeah it's, it's um, I think the medical profession is just going through such it's just yeah. a dead loss at the moment they've, they've got it completely wrong haven't they somewhere someone's got it completely wrong I agree wrong. with you my, my elder sister is, is a is a, is a ward sister and she, she said oh. it's just it's they're the people at the top are incompetent really yeah they're, they're this management they bought it's all management isn't it they haven't a clue it's all the management on mm. and so the health care the actual what's money. important yeah. what yeah, really nursing and, and mm. doctors are about is put to the to the back and that's so wrong we've yeah, got but it's money for money again it's all, yeah, that's just the trap. money but we've got and it's just bad money it's just i just can't they just seem to do things such short term i can't i can't mm. believe that they don't see how these things pan out that they don't have the imagination to see how by doing a certain thing well i mean i can see i'm not the brightest person in the world how some things will you can mm. see it yourself but they don't seem no. to but it's also short term we've got um, in cranley we've got a village hospital it's actually the oldest village hospital in the country it was the first it goes back to the early um, 1800s and it's a lovely it's a listed property obviously and it's um they, they're so desperate to close it they are so desperate to close it and i think they're talking about trying to get more health in the community, and yet they're doing that when Guildford Main Hospital is just struggling and yeah. can't cope and is closing more different. And yet, and yet this is a perfect, it serves the community perfectly. We can get old people in there when they're, they can't, their, their family can't cope at home for respite care. They can come in. It's small, it's friendly, about 30 beds. Small, it's friendly. It so what are these people going to do? I mean, what do these people at the top think? Where do they think these people are going to go? They're just going to just yeah. disappear into the ether. Yeah. Because they don't want to know anything about it, it costs money. Well, they're just not there anymore. People just disappear. Well, people don't disappear. I mean, they have these problems. I just can't make Push them more so and more angry. onto like, the primary health care yeah. providers. And they take away <laughs> the resources that were there, but they don't put any more resources no. back to the GPs. And That's stuff. right, they kick people out of hospital early yeah. and expect someone, someone's going to look after Well, who's going to look after them? They've taken away the resources for um, for nurses in the community and uh, I, I don't know, I just, ludicrous, makes me so cross. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting very political here. We are, we? Right? We, get, uh, we get very political. Any other questions for Sarah? Either political or non-political? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> don't ask me about long or rather, rather, <laughs> rather <laughs> music, why? If you could be a spice scale, which one would you be? Oh, I wouldn't be posh. Or would you like to be that? <laughs> or would you be something completely different? I'm sure she speaks very highly of me, but I can't stand it. Um, Sounds to me, if you're a spice scale, you wouldn't be posh, no matter. <laughs> <laughs> she must be cold all the time. She doesn't seem to wear it much, does she? She goes out at night, there's no even put a coat on. I could be really facetious about her, but I won't. I shall refrain oh. from saying something, no. Um, I'd like to be sporty spice, but she sees like I don't know, I mean they're all pretty. <laughs> all odd. pretty, yeah. They're all pretty strange. Aren't now, they? Aren't they? My daughter was into them quite in a, in a big way a couple of years ago when they were at their height. Peak, that's yeah. all. But I think they're part yeah. of peaking now. Yeah, really. So it's all downhill. And I can't understand his mm. argument with Jerry Hallowell. They, they won't stand on the stage together or something. It all sounds very mm. bizarre. Oh, yeah, very bad. Well, well I think she, she left in the middle of the an American tour, oh, didn't right, she? She, broke a con she must have broken a contract then. She did, she was just like, she naughty. said, well, I won't be appearing tonight, I'm off. Bye. You know. It leaves them in it a bit, doesn't it? Mm. Can't do. be a nice tissue to be, I shouldn't be. No. Halfway through a tour, people expect a certain thing, and then you're not you're not providing what, what you said you'd provide. It, I think if they can't infirm, prove their point, they were the most part advertising. Yeah, that's right, yes. They said that. It was five. Yeah, they, it wasn't. No. But in some respects, I can see what, why she's done that because the Spice Girls won't go on forever. By by leaving now, when they're or oh, when she yes. did at their height, she has a chance to make a yeah. career as a solo artist. If she waits until the whole thing blows oh, up, yeah. Yeah. that's going to be. Has been, aren't they? Then. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, what, what do you do? Do you eke it out for another three or four years and then hope for the best, or do you try and do something? I think the Beckham is just so. I mean, I have to say, I read everything about it because I just, yeah. I just find it so fascinating. Yeah. 
It's just they can't make their mind up whether they want to be celebrities or they don't want to be celebrities. Yeah. I wish they'd just make their mind up. Yeah. Either they want to be in Hello Magazine or they don't want to be in Hello <laughs> Magazine. I mean, if you, if you want that, well, do that, but then don't say, whinge about your privacy, I don't know. Cake and eat yeah. it springs to mind. Right. Very strange. Yeah. I know, you can see who wears the trousers in that house. Victoria. <laughs> 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 She, she comes out and she says, I'm David Beckham. <laughs> <laughs> he looks like a really nice lad, actually. I just I feel sorry. He might be good looking, but he's not much upstairs, really. He's not really <laughs> soft. Who is it? Oh, he looks much better now he's got his head and that silly, floppy hairdo. Um, what was it? Some, someone did a take off of him, was it? And she was at one end of the table. Who was it? There was a. Oh, oh, oh yeah, it was a spoof, wasn't it, yeah. on and TV? Yeah. Who was talking about the dinner? No, that's at night and night. Why did you cook this cucumber? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it was pretty, was it? I can't remember. I can't remember yeah. what it was now. It was one of those sketch shows, wasn't it? It was a. It was a really good oh, uh, program on Radio Four. They stopped. It's finished now. But it, used to, it was a, about tea time, and it was just impressionist sketches. And they used to always have David and Victoria. Oh, yeah. It was usually <laughs> a telephone conversation. Or <laughs> well, one time you heard him come in, and she said to him, "You." Your dinner's in the oven, and you heard the door open, and all this, oh, this water splashing everywhere. Said, oh, is, it, is it soup? She said, no, no, that's the washing machine. <laughs> <laughs> that's really cruel, isn't it? We should laugh. Didn't she say she loved him for his intelligence or something? <laughs> yeah. something I think bizarre. the thing is... Well, he wears her underwear. He wears her <laughs> <laughs> To a certain extent, I mean, you, you had this as well, to, to a certain mm. degree. You're, you're, you're put into a fame. You have a bit of money to spend, and it... It's coping with that, isn't it? Yeah. Well, that much money to spend. No, no, <laughs> yeah, no, I know what you're saying, yes. Perhaps yes. the fame more than the, yes. the, uh, yeah. the money. Then. They've got millions, obviously, in the yeah, bank. £12,000 on a one-year-old's party or something. Mm. I mean, you don't want to believe everything you read in the papers, right? But, I mean, even so, cool. But you must have found that to a certain degree. You know, you, you, you had a little bit of money in your pocket, and you, you were independent, and your face mm. is known. Your privacy, all of a sudden, is, is not your own, really, is it? Yes, I mean, I never experienced anything like that. Yeah people do today. I mean, I, I think in the last 10 years, 15 years, it's gone completely crazy, hasn't it? I don't... I think if I don't you get paid 25 grand a week, though, you're going to make some sacrifices. Well, that's right. When yes. Louise Jensen was here, she said she had people <laughs> camping out on the, the office doorstep. At least. <laughs> yeah. oh, really? Louise actually had the, the press, well, some newspaper were on her doorstep when she woke up in the morning. And that must be horrible. That must be gussy. It never happened to me. And going through, just this, going through her garbage and things like that. Oh, God. Oh. What on earth for? I don't know. What are they betting to yeah. find? Are they beamed in? I don't know. Oh, <laughs> wow, look. <laughs> James has been great beamed. <laughs> are people really interested in that? I suppose they, they think they must be, I suppose, because they wouldn't bother. People sound very old. Any other questions? What's your favourite pastime or interest? Uh, oh. No, there's a thing, you see, I've got, I, because I like doing things that move move on, I'm not very good at doing things for a long, long space of time, I'm interested in lots of things, lots of arty things, I um, got into calligraphy a couple of years ago, and I, I really enjoyed that, but then I dropped that, and now I'm doing mosaics is my thing at the moment, um, but they take so long to make, I haven't made very many, um, because I don't have the time, but I'm really into that, and then I'll suddenly think, just doing a bit of calligraphy. Someone asked me to do something, and so I'll do a bit of calligraphy, and then I'll go back to the mosaics. I'd love to do pottery, that's my, my next thing. And I love gardening, I'm really into my garden. Um, so, actually, I mean, I like trying all sorts of different things, and I'm learning Spanish now. I quite like new challenges. You do, don't yeah. you? Yeah. I've done, um, did a course in with Martin Cheek, who's one of the top mosaic artists in the country in um, Kent. Spent a long weekend, with about 20 of us. Um, did three days over a weekend. Um, this is what mosaic is like a floor mosaic or a wall? you do tables, um, mirrors, and things. But actually, learning how to do it properly is is um, is little really little squares, yeah. is it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot of them they're very fashionable. The mosaics are very in. I mean, all these home front programs say, "Oh, let's do a mosaic table for here." I mean, you can just very sort of in at the moment. But a lot of the tables and things you see around there, like a bit like crazy paving. Like just mm -hmm. any old shape, and you just sort of fit it in, and you've got a wide grout between the two bits of tile. Mm -hmm. That's not really proper mosaic. Because it mosaic goes back like to Roman, Roman and Grecian yeah. times, doesn't it? Originally. Where you work with squares as much as possible, and you only cut when you have to. And the gap between the two shouldn't be that wide. 
so you get a, a, you can you know, the effects you get are completely different. But they're much cheaper, and often ones that are brought in from India and the Far East are done that way because they're cheap to do. But Martin Cheek, if you get if you get him to do a mosaic for you, it's a thousand pounds per square meter. Wow. wow. He must be good at what he does. He's brilliant. I mean, you, I, I do. A thousand pounds per square meter. That's uh, three feet by three feet, feet approximately, isn't yeah. it? That's a lot of money, isn't it? Mm. But if he's doing a lot of cut, he needs some beautiful ones, like huge things of the peacocks. I just, you wouldn't think that with these little squares that you could actually get the effect that you can. It's fascinating. I, I mean, I really, I love it. How long would it take to do, say, square meter? It depends on the design. It does depend on it. how much cutting. I mean, if it's a, a background, for instance, and you're just you're laying squares, it can be quite quick. Mm. But if you're doing a lot of cutting, um, then it can take. Well, I've just done a table, a coffee table, um, using ceramics, which is quicker because you can use both sides of ceramic. They're flat. I should have brought some with me to show you. Um, but if you use glass, they have a front and a back, and once you start quartering those. You, they, they can rock, so you really have to work indirect with that, and that's yeah. something I've got to practice. You have to do it backwards and rest of it. But this ceramic one I've done was about that long by about that wide, and that took me about three weeks, but not doing it every day and not doing it all day every day. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. you, you do get a bit. Would well, you like to do this, like perhaps moving to it as a job, maybe? Like I'd, I'd never, I'd never, <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't want to rely on it to keep to pay my mortgage, I know that, because I'm so slow. I mean, I tend to. And then I have sold. I had sold something. I did sell a little table once. I had some wrought iron legs made for it. It was a little chess table with a pattern around the outside in ceramic again, and that didn't take me very long to do because it wasn't very big. But um, it's the only thing I've sold. So I think I'd go very hungry if I had to rely on living off doing it's difficult the Difficult as well, isn't it? If you're doing, if it's something you enjoy doing, it's often a shame if you want to then try and. I know, Turn it into money making. I made a really nice blue wave mirror, and it was really pretty. And I, we tried to sell it, but um, no one's wanted it. And I thought, I actually quite like that. I think I'll keep that for myself when I redo the bathroom and put it in the bathroom. You could bring some to conventions and sell them there. Yeah, I should do. Mm. So they're quite expensive. Annika sells a few of the paintings here. Yeah, I did she? Yeah. See, that's the other thing. I'd I want to do a watercolour course. I, I mean, I love anything arty. Mm. And I love watercolours, and I'd love to be able to do that properly. So one day I'm going to go to Fittleworth and have a do a course there. I was going to mention Anna because she things. had her own gallery, I think, in Canada, or in Montreal, was it, or somewhere, Vancouver? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Vancouver. Vancouver. Um, and she brought a lot of her paintings along, so it's something she really likes, mm. and she, it's a little sideline for her, I suppose, if you want to call it. If you can sell them and everything. I mean, paintings, you can do them much quicker. Mosaics that, that, that's Anna's wheel, is up there. Oh, is it? So and that one is, they're, they're two of Anna's Are they um, pastels? That, that, that's, that's a, a pastel, pastel, pastel I think that is as well, yes. But she does watercolours, oils, everything. She gives me a pastel of our cottage. I sent her. I got chatting to her and she was here and I just sent her the photos. I think that's actually her house there. Uh, that was that's done on the day of the eclipse. That on the Isn't so that funny? I was going to say that sky is a very strange colour. Mm. It's, it's the day of the yes. eclipse. <laughs> she, she did it. She thought it would be an interesting Thing, yes. uh, light wise to, to, to do it's it. Which is probably why They're it's beautiful. It. Gosh, she's talented. Well, dear, maybe I won't decide to do it. <laughs> 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 put me off. No, she's lovely. My daughter enjoys doing all that sort of stuff as well. So when I have a bedroom upstairs where I have all my books and all my um, tiles and a table and everything. And she will sit on the floor when I'm doing mosaics and fiddle around and make patterns. And she's quite happy or she gets paints out and does a picture. And she quite enjoys sitting there with me doing it, which is nice because it's a time we, we sit and chat and, and doing that together. It's, it's a, nice, a nice time for us to together. Good. Any other questions? Shall we wrap it up? Anybody else? Mm -hmm. I think we'll wrap it up. Great. Thank you very Lovely. much, Sarah Sutton. Oh, <laughs> we have a little break now. I think we're going to have something to eat later on, hopefully. Um, yeah, nice <laughs> yeah. I saw those roast potatoes in I'll, the I'll go and see uh, where we're at. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.